Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, having lived in Zambia for almost eight years now and working with uh, policymakers, I can tell you it's tough. <laughs> and being a policy analyst and try to communicate these results to policymakers, it can be very challenging but very enriching. Uh, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to come and share. Uh, see, the title might be misleading, but I hope I'll keep you engaged. I'm going to talk about sub-Saharan Africa. I'm not going to, I mean, once in a while I will put Zambia in. I will do Zambia a disfavor if I don't put some statistics from, from, from Zambia. Let me start on a lighter note. He's my favorite philosopher, favorite thinker. I always present this to the policymakers whenever I meet them. There are three quotations that uh, I like. The first one is, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. The second one, it's about insanity. Says so doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. This is something that our policymakers do in Africa and expect different results. The third and last one is that anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. So as scientists, that's why we are there. We try new things. We want to solve problems. And at times we make mistakes. At times we get the right solution to solve the problems. And we add value to our nations. So what is the challenge? The main challenge in sub-Saharan Africa is that we usually try to implement very costly programs, but very ineffective in sol solving issues to do with poverty and food security and nutrition. What it is, is that we put the horse before the cart, and usually conventional wisdom rules the day. And this is also spilled over into programs that we run as donors, <coughs> as individuals, we have ignored evidence in our day-to-day -day decision making. So you find that policies in Africa are divorced from the evidence that we generate. That's the world I am coming from. No matter how good your evidence is, how do you communicate it to the policymakers who care about winning elections. So the political economy of what we do is very critical. So now let me go into my, my, my presentation with that uh, uh, introduction. What is the roadmap? I will do some introduction and end with some conclusions and recommendations. But that's no silver bullet that I'm going to present, but I'm going to present some thinking that I have experienced over, over the years. Um, agriculture is key in any economy. It is the source of employment. It is the source of food. And I think we heard from yesterday that we need to be inclusive in order for agriculture to be a solution in Africa. Why? I will say a little bit about that a little bit later. There are several things happening in the world, including Africa, and these are mega trends. And Tom and colleague have done marvelous work on these mega trends, and I will run through them very fast. There is rapid population growth, uh, there is rising land scarcity, uh, the rise of these imagined farmers, the investor farmers, uh, labor force, and uh, I mean people are exiting farming, the youth are going out of farming. 
We also have uh, rapid population growth. That is, uh, demand is rising, and the demand for mostly protein uh, 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 foods. We also have the agri-food system is transforming. And this does not necessarily mean that our policies are also transforming at the same pace as agri-food uh, systems. We have the rise of supermarkets in, in Africa. And if you look at who supplies those supermarkets, uh, you find that it's mostly the larger guys who are able to weave through the requirements of these uh, supermarkets. Uh, we also have large-scale capital investments in Africa. I mean, uh, corporations are coming in in, in in numbers to try to invest, invest in Africa. And also, we have rapid urbanization and rising incomes. Basically, a lot of opportunities being created because of these things that are happening. But the question that I ask is, are our policies also changing at the same pace as these uh, 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 mega trends? A little bit about population. I think uh, people said that uh, yesterday, I think, was presented that population in Africa is rising. But I thought I can show you here where you see that in 2015, sub-Saharan Africa population about uh, uh, 0.92 billion, the rest of the world 6.1, but by the year 2050 it's projected that Africa's population is gonna double. And you can see here the rate of uh, growth is very minimal, and in by about 2100, it's gonna be 3.8 billion, and the rest of the world decline. So basically it means that the people we need to feed in Africa is increasing and is increasing at a very fast rate, which requires our policies, our science, our, uh, uh, our economies to also evolve faster so that they can contain this rapid growth in population. But if we look at who is supplying Africa with food, if we look at the total imports, food imports, when we compare food imports within the sub-Saharan Africa itself, this is the, the red uh, bars, eh? and so Africa is being fed from the rest of the world. We are not feeding ourselves. This does not necessarily mean that we don't have good soils. This does not mean that we don't have good water. We do, but unfortunately our uh, yields remain very low. Um, poverty rates, alarming, alarmingly very high. I think I'll focus on Zambia. You can see this is from 1996 to 2015. This is the rural poverty. You can see it has not gone down. So that means we do have a challenge that we need to sort out. And Zambia is not alone. There are many other countries that have got high poverty rates. Hence, how do we achieve sustainable poverty uh, reduction in Africa? Climate change, I mean, it's a threat and agriculture is one of the main culprits. In terms of uh, CO2 emissions, agriculture is, and uh, crops and, and animals uh, are a culprit. And 15% of those emissions, in terms of agricultural uh, CO2 emissions, are coming from, from Africa. So it's really a threat. And one of the solutions, I think, uh, uh, FAO, I think, came up with uh, this climate smart, and we, I mean, it's the, 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 the adoption of some of the practices are terribly very low. So the answer is why. If we look at the tree cover deforestation and how it relates to livelihoods, you find that uh, this is back in uh, 2001. Uh, and if you look at 2015, you can see that the pink area represents areas with less than 30% tree cover. That means we are losing quite a bit in terms of uh, tree cover. And in terms of deforestation, it's projected that Africa will lose about 4% of its forest cover. And why? Wood fuel timber demand is increasing in Africa. A lot of people are using charcoal. Um, and also, there's increased, increased electricity shortages in, in, in Africa itself. 
Hence, you find that uh, people tend to now demand uh, uh, charcoal as, as a source of electricity, also the culture, where we want to boil our beans for four hours. It requires uh, uh, more energy. There is also increase in demand of African hard hardwoods, so there is more trees being, being, being cut. There is also farm expansion. Uh, I mean, yesterday we were discussing about these large-scale uh, farm investments. Usually it entails trees being, being, being cut, human settlements, construction, mining, and urbanization. I think there's a lot of investment going into Africa, but of course this has got issues uh, that we need to, to deal with. And also you find that because of insecure uh, land tenure systems, you find that people tend to do what they want. So they are... Uh, the weak forest government and systems are affecting uh, 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 the situation. Um, according to the AU, Malawi Declaration in uh, 2014, they want accelerated agricultural growth transformation for shared prosperity and improved livelihoods for Africa. And this entails trying to uphold the Maputo Declaration of putting at least 10% of the public resources to agriculture. Try to sustain annual agricultural growth in terms of GDP to at least 6%, to end hunger by the year 2025, to accelerate uh, agricultural growth, uh, doubling, doubling agricultural productivity levels by the year 2025, to halve poverty, uh, sorry, post-harvest losses by uh, year 2025, to triple agricultural inter, uh, intra-African trade by 2025, and to also to eliminate uh, uh, stunting and underweight among its children. Very noble goals. Are we on track? You find that most countries are off track. And we are off track also in terms of, the, of attaining the SDG DG goals. So what do we need to do? Where do you think Africa's agriculture is? Is it crawling? Is it walking? Is it running? Is it flying? Most countries are here. Others said... Uh, they are still in uh, still born. They are not born yet. A few countries are making some progress. They are walking. And probably South Africa and others are maybe in the running stage. But where do we want the agricultural sector in Africa to be? To be here. Africa has the potential to feed itself. But we need the right policies. We need the right technology. We need the right you know, institutional capacity. There are several hindrances to agricultural sector in, in Africa, whereby we see that uh, we don't have policies that are progressive. We try to use policies from the past to try to solve problems of now, I mean, problems of today. We also have low productivity. There is high land degradation. The education and skills of the majority of the farmers is very low, and also the failure to embrace new technology. There's price volatility. Farmers are not able to plan because as prices go up and down, you find that uh, as, a, as a farmer, you're not able to plan for the future. And also trade barriers and, of course, climate change is, 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 is really a hindrance to making uh, Africa's uh, agriculture sector to, to fly. But however, among us, this, there, has, there is progress that has been made. What we have seen is our growth has been growing, according to, to the, uh, some countries have surpassed the CADAP target, targets, and also we see incomes rising among some of, 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 of the, 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 uh, the households. Uh, in general, we see that uh, per capita income was about 1,154 between 2003 to 2008, and it slightly gone up to 1,289 per, per, per capita. And also incidences of poverty going down slightly, as well as uh, 
the uh, food and nutrition indicators are also going down. But if you look here, you find that uh, we really have made just minor progress. It's not something that we can really uh, write home about, but we are making some progress. Post harvest losses. FAO predicts that about 1.3 billion tons, this is a statistic from 2011, uh, of food globally is lost, is wasted or lost per year. And it is lost along the value chain from on the field, during handling and storage, processing and packing, distribution and consumption. But if you look at uh, uh, the developing uh, world compared to the developed countries, you find that the developed countries lose most of the food at consumption level. And Africa is it's, 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 it's in the development, it's mostly on the fields as well as in terms of handling and storage, but uh, as well as I uh, think in terms of distribution. So the issue is how do we try to sort uh, this major problem? And there's an estimate that uh, uh, between 2005 and 2007, grain losses were estimated at 4 billion uh, of the total value of production, which was 27 billion. And this 4 billion was equivalent to 48 million people's annual caloric uh, requirement and greater than the food aid to sub Saharan Africa over 10 years. So, this is a big problem and needs to be sorted out. And as scientists, we are called upon to really put our effort to try to see how best we can minimize uh, uh, these post-harvest losses. Energy issues, you find that uh, in terms of sub-Saharan Africa, our uh, production is very low. And in terms of uh, sources of electricity, you find that uh, sub-Saharan Africa relies mostly on coal and hydropower whilst uh, Middle East and North Africa rely mostly on natural gas and, and oil. So there are some initiatives that, that are being done currently to try to, to have sustainable sources of energy in Africa. I mean, we have the sun, the bulk of the time during the day. I mean, it's, it's, we are not utilizing solar energy enough. So there are initiatives such as the Sustainable Energy Fund for Africa, Power Africa, all these are, run, uh, are being managed by Africa Development Bank, uh, I think with funding from, from the American people. And also we have the Africa EU Renewable Energy uh, Fund that is investing in small hydro, wind, geothermal, solar, natural gas, and biomass projects across sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, excluding South Africa, because South Africa is, is, is a big player in, 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 in Africa. And in terms of the bioeconomies in, in, in Africa, I say, see, if you look at the range of crops that these different countries grow, different. Southern Africa, if you look at West Africa, there are different crops. So Africa has the capacity to trade among itself and be able to feed its own people. But the issue is high transportation costs. The issue is uh, infrastructure development is not so good. It's cheaper to import, to get deep sea imports into South Africa and get it into Zambia than moving goods from Zambia into Zimbabwe. So those are ish practical issues that we need, we need to, to deal with. Uh, in terms of Zambia, if I bring it to the local level, you find that it's also very diverse. Different agroecological zones have different potential, so we can take advantage of this diversity. If we take advantage of this, we may be able to make these countries as rich as, 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 as any other, other country in the world. So, I'm trying to change the direction of the presentation a little bit. We always talk of smallholder farmers, and smallholder farmers in Africa are many. We have millions of them, and about 80% of all farms in sub-Saharan Africa are less than two hectares. And this is a reality. So policies that are developed, technologies that are developed, need to realize that this is a fact of life. And among us, the 80%, they are not 
a heterogeneous, I mean, a homogeneous group. They are a heterogeneous group. So no silver bullet. There are others who can be able to commercialize. There are others who can only produce for subsistence. So when we develop our technologies, we need to take into account this, this fact that we have millions of smallholder farmers. And they are responsible for most of the production. Uh, I think I've already talked about the, the, the heterogeneity. But most of them remain poor, malnourished, and less educated. So the education level of farmers in most of sub-Saharan Africa is very low. Hence, high-tech, low-tech issues, I think we have to think about how we can communicate some of our findings to, 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 to the farmers. How can we design extension systems to, to, to deal with, the, with, with that? Uh, I have to move a little bit faster. I see the moderator is looking at the time. These farmers face a lot of constraints, land constraints, unpredictable weather, there's issues of high transport costs. And for funders or for bankers, what do they see? They see risks. A small order farmer is risky, so they don't put resources to that sector. So this, I think, in the morning session, we dealt with the bioeconomies, and uh, I think uh, Siani has been doing fant fantastic work. Uh, the issue of why the uptake is problematic is because small order farmers think of today, they don't think of tomorrow. So any technology that will accrue benefits three years down the road will never be adopted because farmers are looking for today. They are looking to eat today. They are looking to, to get money today. So it's very difficult for them to look at conservation agriculture, for example, which are, the benefits accrue two, three seasons. So that means there's a public good nature of conservation agriculture, which our governments have to take into account because the benefits accrue to the farmers a little bit later. Uh, so the status of bio, bio, biotech, I think what I want to talk about is this uh, quote from the president of, uh, the late president of Zambia. He says, simply because my people are hungry, that is no justification to give poison to them. This is the GMOs. Maybe let me re read it nicely. Simply because my people are hungry, that is no justification to give them poison to give them genetically modified food that is intrinsically dangerous to their health. So it's a technology that is there, but the acceptability is low, and it's coming from the high level. So you can forget that GMO will ever penetrate the country. So what do we do? We have to start working backwards and finding other solutions apart from biotech and GMO uh, crops. Conservation agriculture, the same thing. Adoption rates have been very low. So how do we get more for farmers to the market? Productivity has to go up. It's very low. Uh, we have to increase the market share uh, for food crops and to make sure that we reduce uh, uh, post-harvest losses. And also, we have to optimize income generation through better access to remunerative markets. And we need to promote sustainable uptake of available technology. Uh, extension services have to be improved. Manage inputs and uh, price shocks. Foster access by means of innovative financing systems. And also we need to improve the incentives by addressing challenges and risks for, for them. I mean, there are so many other innovations that are there, but the uptake is very minimal. So what are the strategies to get sustainable poverty reduction. I look at it and there are three, I look, when I look at it, there are three legs to it. There is policy options, there is institutional options, and there is technological options. And in terms of the technological options, I mean, we talk of uh, uh, mobile banking, mechanization, irrigation, agro-processing and value addition, biotechnology, agroforestry, etc. But however, it has to be long-term investments. You cannot go into a community and, in, and be there for three years and think that things will change. It takes time. It has taken us nine years to change one single policy. 
the government to move from a traditional uh, system of delivering fertilizer to farmers to an electronic voucher. Nine years. And thanks to the Swedish people, your funding is now uh, getting those results that we all wanted. CEDA funds IAPRI, including the American people. And if it was not because of this funding and concerted effort, communicating with the policymakers to get change, we would not have done that. So long-term investments, even when we talk of capacity building, it's not a two-year program, it's not a three-year program. It has, to, we have to look into the future. Thank you, I have three minutes. We basically have to build local capacity. Policy options, we need to increase public uh, sector uh, uh, investments. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about it in the next slide. We need to promote uh, private sector, uh, I mean the four Ps. Uh, we need to have value chain financing, embrace private sector-led uh, agricultural marketing and trade, ensure stable and predictable policies. In, uh, we need inclusive uh, policies. As, as I said, no one strategy is a silver bullet. We need to realize that the smallholder farmers, there are many. We also have the emergent farmers, we have the large farmers. So we need to take everyone on board and be able to develop uh, agriculture in Africa. Then we need a multi-sectoral approach and we need to have policies that promote modernization of the agricultural sector. But uh, nevertheless, there's always a tug of war. We need not to ignore the political economy in the countries. The politicians want to win elections. So as researchers, you need to look at that. If you don't, half the time your evidence is thrown in the trash. Okay, I think I'll skip this one. This has to do with uh, uh, returns to, to investment. And the most three important is R&D, roads and education. But Africa puts very little to these three key drivers of agricultural growth. So we need to find ways of encouraging African governments to put more into these three key drivers of, of growth. Okay, I think I talked already about price, uh, prices. Uh, trade, I think I've already talked about it. And finance, I think this will be my last, uh, last one. As I said, Financiers look at small order farmers as risky people, so there is no finance going to them. But how can we stimulate small order production if we cannot finance them? They don't have collateral that is required by the banks. Interest rates are high. They can be as high as 30 to 50 percent, and you can tell me which business can give you a return of 30 to 50 percent. I'm not sure here in Sweden whether your interest rates are as high as that, but we expect small order farmers. To, to get a return higher than that. Hence, you find that there's not enough going to, to, to small order farmers, and also there's low repayment rates. Um, the institutional options, I think land tenure systems. We need to build a critical mass of well-trained young Africans. I'm one of them. I was trained by Tom Jane there, and I decided to go back home because that's where I can make a difference. And we need to develop and nurture supporting domestically funded research. I think it's very important because if the notion is that this is coming from a donor, you find that they will work with you, but once you leave, the project dies. So this is why it's important to encourage governments to put money into any of these uh, research uh, uh, projects. And also we need to build capacity uh, through education and skills training of public technical staff, as well as uh, youth and, f and, and farmers. Okay, this is about IAPRI. I have three slides, but uh, let, me, <laughs> let me thank uh, and acknowledge uh, the funding that we get from the embassy of Sweden and the American people. Thank you.